Hey family, I'm Pastor Torre. Welcome to One YouTube channel. You're getting ready to hear a phenomenal message. It's going to bless you. I have a couple of quick announcements really quickly. First of all, if you're not subscribed to this channel, go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you'll be notified anytime we go live, anytime we've got something that's going to bless you. Number two, if you want to support our ministry, we do great things as you're going to experience, but we also do great practical things and we can certainly uh, use your support. The instructions are on the screen if you want to give. And last but not least, my new book, Balance, is available for pre-order now. It is a game-changing, life-changing book. You can go to thebalancebook.com and get it, and there's certain things that you will have access to just by pre-ordering. So go to the website. All the information is there. Now let's get into this powerful, amazing word. God bless you. Happy Sunday, family. Can I tell you that if you're watching, whether it is your first time or you are an OG, you are family because when you connect with what God is doing, you become our brothers and our sisters in the faith. And we are so excited for this family reunion that we're having right now. You don't even know it, but you got a cousin watching from Africa. You got a best friend watching from Massachusetts. We are family and One Online is so excited that we get to do life with you. It is such an honor and a privilege to walk this thing out with you. I don't know about you, but I am still so full off of PT series conversations with God and self and others that it's hard for me to even stand in this moment because I just feel like if we replayed those messages, you're going to hear something you haven't heard before and get completely blessed. Yet it is my responsibility and mandate to show up in this moment with the word that God has given me. I know that it's just going to add to what PT is already building. Aren't you so grateful that we have an incredible shepherd in PT, that he's constantly feeding us and going before the feet of Jesus to see what he can bring back to us? And he has laid out an incredible feast over the last few weeks. So this is just dessert. I just have a little creme brulee, okay? Bread pudding. What is it? I'm doing 75 hearts, so just sugar. And you could literally give me just a cup of sugar and it would be dessert. Uh, okay, I'm going to be in Judges, Judges 6. I was studying about Deborah, incidentally, and then just continued reading and stumbled upon the story of Gideon. I love this story so much. And in the process of studying it, I really felt like God was awakening something in my spirit. Gideon this is uh, an incredible story of a man who was minding his own business. Come on, mind your business ministries. He's minding his own business. When God speaks a word and a declaration and sends him signs and responsibilities that honestly seem beyond him. He's like of the least tribes. He's really just trying to survive from day to day and stay out of the way. Doesn't want to cause any trouble. Just wants to find a way to live his system and to get in his routine. And God calls him out of his routine. That is actually the name of this message. Get out of your routine. Get out of your routine. That's already hitting somebody in the spirit. I know it is because you're trying to figure out how do I break this routine? How do I get out of this pattern? This pattern of self-doubt, this pattern of showing up in my life but not feeling passion. I've been in my own way breaking out of my routine. And when I tell you there is life-changing power on the other side of your routine, there's breakthrough on the other side of your routine. I want somebody to go ahead and allow that word to hit them in their spirit, that God has heard your prayers. God hears what you've been thinking about. God hears how your spirit Spirit has been unsettled. You've been anxious for more. You've been waiting for more. And God says, I'm about to pull you out of your routine. Anxiety is not your routine. Depression is not your routine. Frustration is not your routine. Heartbreak is not your routine. I hear God saying that it is time for you to get out of your routine. It's time for you to come out of that cave that you have been in and to show up. There's fresh oil for every day. There's fresh power for every day. There's creativity still assigned to your name. I hear God saying it's it's not going to be what I did for other people, that I've got a new thing that I want to do just for you. And because it is a new thing, I need you to be willing to break out of the old so that you can step into the new. I hear someone saying, I hear someone thinking to themselves, but the new is all, the old is all that I've known. The old is what makes me comfortable. But I hear God saying that when you step into this new thing, you can't grieve the old thing at the same time because this new thing is going to require everything that I place down on the inside of you to come 
come out of you. I feel like prophesying already, but I feel like God is pulling someone out of a cave, that God is pulling someone out of a darkness. And that place that you call darkness, it used to be home, but now it is a cave. And I hear God saying that it's time for you to come out of it. It is okay for you to grow. It is okay for you to change. It is okay for you to not need the same things that once fed you. And you have to give yourself permission to get out of your routine. Permission granted. Holy Spirit, have your way. Permission granted. Somebody's watching and they're going to step out on faith. Permission granted, God. I'm giving you permission to pull me out of my routine. I want someone to type that in the comments. Permission granted. Permission granted. But be careful when you say it. Because when you give God permission, he's not just going to stand by idly. When you give God permission, he's going to start disrupting your life. Permission granted, God. You can break the stronghold. Permission granted, God. You can help me come out of this relationship. Permission granted granted I want out of this routine I want out of this addiction permission granted permission granted Holy Spirit have your way have your way have your way and in Judges 6 Gideon Gideon gives the angel of the Lord permission to proceed with the mission that God has sent him on the mission that Gideon has been created for Genesis 6, verse 22. And it says, Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon has an encounter with the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord shows up. He performs a sign and wonder for Gideon. And Gideon's like, all right, now that I've seen that this is actually the Lord, I have perceived that this is you. So Gideon says, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still in Orphra of the Abizarites. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took 10 men from among his servants and did as the Lord said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Get out of your routine. Spirit of the living God, <laughs> there is nothing routine about you. Yes, you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, but you do new things. You do new things on the inside of us. You create new vision. You create new strategy, God. There is nothing stale or routine about you, God. You continue to mesmerize us with your exceedingly and abundantly way of being. And so, God, we are praying that this would not just be a routine Sunday, that this would not just be a routine message, that this would not just be something we put on in the background to check off the mark that we listen to a word from God, but that this would be a life change a spirit transforming, a soul stirring message that pulls us out of the routine of our history and propels us into the destiny that you have for us. Spirit of the living God, fall as only you can. And as for me, God, I pray too that you would pull me out of my routine, that I would not need for this message to go the way that I see it in my head, but that this would be a message that has been signed by God and by God alone. So have your way, great God that you are. We receive this word, we receive your love, we receive the truth that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. You gotta say amen in the comments. I don't know, one of the things I've learned in the pandemic, like you gotta say amen two times, I don't know, I didn't even realize it, but I just, you gotta, If I don't know, we'll talk about it later, that's next week's message.
You know, when I first met PT, actually, if I could do it all over again, you know, I did push up on him. I did tell PT, I was like, you know, like, what's up, PT? Take me out to dinner. Um, but, like, if I had to do it all over again, I think I would change the way that we had that moment. If you haven't heard the story, it's a long story. I don't have time to get into it. But he was talking to me all during church. And I knew he wanted to feed me by the way he kept talking to me during church. And so eventually I was like, listen, I'm coming to L.A. You can take me to dinner. If I had to do it all over again, though, we're almost eight years into marriage, I think that I would have said to him instead, you look like the kind of person I could lose myself in. To be clear, that is not lose myself for or lose myself to. But you seem like the type of person I could lose myself in in you and I, and together we could become one. Because when you are with someone worth losing yourself in, what you receive in return is more beautiful than what you've lost. And that is why becoming one is something so powerful. Of course, I could not have said that then because I did not know what I know now. When we first got married, I was on my I-N-D-E-P. I was independent. I was on my independent vibe, so strong, so heavy, okay? And I was so afraid as a single mother who had fought to be in a position where she could take care of her children that I would lose myself to him. And because I was afraid of losing myself to him, I couldn't really receive myself. You see, because when we are in relationship with people, it's not just so that we can show up for them, and it's not just so that they can fit within our little picture. When we are in relationship with someone, there is, a, there is an expectation and a reality that you are going to lose parts of yourself. When you have a baby, you can't say, I'm still going to be up all night and doing what I want to do, and the baby is just going to find a way to fit into my life. No, you lose a part of yourself, but what you gain in return is worth what you lose lose along the way. And I know that we live in a generation that makes you feel like you have to hold on to yourself at any given cost, but I'm telling you there is no way that you can be successful in relationship unless you are willing to lose a bit of yourself. Now, this is how we qualify that losing. We qualify that losing by making sure that I'm not giving up a piece of myself in exchange for something that is not worthy of what I'm giving up. It is an equal trade. It is a transfer, and that transfer is equal. Yes, I lost this part of my independence, but what I gained in partnership through your perspective is worth what I lost from being an independent woman. That idea, though, is why so many relationships end up suffering. Because people are always living with the fear of losing themselves, the fear of the end of me. I know that this is going to be the end of me, and so I live with this fear. That's why when we get into jobs, we have these jobs, and sometimes we fear when we're working the role that eventually this job is going to come to an end because we don't trust that we can show up in a position, that we can show up in a role, and that it will sustain us. And so we end up self-sabotaging because we're always looking for the end. How how is this going to fall apart? How am I going to lose myself? How is this going to disappoint me? And that self-sabotage, that idea of living with the end in mind keeps us from maximizing our present. If you walk into a situation, a circumstance, an opportunity, and all you can focus on is how it could possibly end, then you cannot effectively maximize that moment which means that you cannot bring the fullness of who you are into a relationship or an opportunity because all you're doing is looking for the exit. You know those people, I've been out to dinner with them, I'm married to one of them, they go to a restaurant, they go to somewhere, and they can't even look at the menu because they need to look at all of the exit points. Is anyone else, my husband is the head of security, and anytime we go anywhere, he's always looking for the exit because he wants to know what is my exit strategy. That's great for when we're in a crowded restaurant, but that same strategy doesn't work when you're in a relationship where you're looking for the exit strategy. It doesn't work when you're being an entrepreneur because an entrepreneur who looks for the exit strategy cannot establish 
establish a business because you're always trying to figure out how can this end, not how can I build it. And when God is calling you to be a builder, the only thing that you can focus on is building. You can't think to yourself, how am I going to close this thing out and how am I going to build it at the same time? You can't raise a newborn thinking about the day they walk out of the house or you're going to miss out on what they need at that stage of their life. If you're going to be in this thing, you're going to have to be in it all of the way. You can't be in ministry thinking about the moment I'm going to step off of the platform. If you're going to be in ministry, you got to be in it 24-7. If God's going to call you out of it, God knows how to get your attention. God doesn't need you to look ahead in the future to figure out how he's, how you're going to get out of what he's already placed you in. If God's placed you in it, you got to stand flat-footed in it and show up with the fullness of who you are because that environment is meant to pull out who God has called you. You see, well, that's the thing that we have to understand about environments. Environments are wombs. It is just as much about what you can do as it is about what this environment is producing down on the inside of me. And because I ne- recognize that it is producing something down on the inside of me, I can't look for my way out or I'm going to miss me. You're going to miss you're going to miss you if you're only looking for the way out. That fear of waiting for the end is how so many people end up betraying themselves because they're waiting for an opportunity to run out. They're waiting for a place to no longer feel safe. This is where we find Gideon in the text. So you got to read the whole story to really recognize this. I found it interesting that the moment that Gideon recognizes that he's speaking to the angel of the Lord, that the angel of the Lord says to him, you're not going to die. The angel of the Lord gives us insight into what Gideon was thinking. It gives us insight into how Gideon was showing up at that season of his life. In that season of his life, Gideon was so deflated. He was so defeated that when he saw the angel of the Lord, he didn't see backup. He saw that this is a sign that I'm going to die. This was finally the end that he had been waiting for. And now the angel of the Lord shows up trying to propel him into something new. But because he's still in that same routine of waiting to die, the angel of the Lord can't even show up in the way that the angel of the Lord wants to show up for him. I wish that I could say that the way that I feel it, but I hear that that's somebody's message. I feel like heaven is trying to tell you that you've been waiting for God to show up and God's been showing up, but you've been calling it the end. That God's been showing up, but you've been taking it as a a sign that it's too good to be true. And there's somebody who's been thinking to themselves, if something is too good to be true, then I don't want to step into it because I don't want to lose it. But I hear God saying that if you would trust and believe that I sent it to you, then you would step into it without fear. And if you step into it without fear, then you will see that this thing is not meant to kill you. It's meant to awaken you. I feel like God wants to wake someone up. When we talk about get out of your routine, it's going to require that you let go of the thinking that this thing is coming to an end and start experiencing life in a fresh new way with the perspective that this could just be the jump off point. I don't know who you are, but I feel like God has been trying to tell someone that 2022 is the year of the jump off point. This is the year where you break out of that routine for once and for for all. Someone's gotten out of the routine once, but you feel yourself slipping back. But I came to serve you notice that there is no slipping back this time. That this time when you break out of your routine, that you're never going back to the way that it used to be. You're never going back to the way that you used to think. And I hear God saying that if you open up your spirit to receive what I want to do in this time, that you will no longer be afraid of things coming to an end, but instead you will be someone who starts something. Where are my warriors in this room? Where are my warriors in this house of God? There are some people who are called to wage war. If you are not a wage warrior, this is not your message. But if you know that you are someone who has been sent to wage war, I want you to take a minute and let me know I'm talking to the right person. Because if you've been called to wage war, then you cannot afford to be defeated at the same time. And God had to wake Gideon back up again. Who are you? I hear God saying, it's time for you to get on fire 
fire again. It's time for you to get passionate again because you were meant to wage war. Your existence was meant to wage war on hell, to wage war on generational curses, to wage war on the industry, to wage war on homelessness, to wage war on the criminal justice system. You were meant to wage war. And if you sit back and get in a routine, then your enemy is going to know how to attack you. But I need someone who is so unpredictable, so spontaneous, that God could be using me this way one day and using me another way the next day because I'm not going to get in a routine when God has called me to blaze a trail. I'm here to wage war with everything that's waging war in my world. If it's happening in my generation, if it's happening in my family, then it's on me to wage war back. It's on me to wage war back. And God's got to wake Gideon up. God's got to wake you up. That this is not just an idea. This is war. Man, I wish I could see you. You're on the other side and you're watching this right now. And I feel like the enemy is playing the biggest trick on your mind by making you think that it's little and it's small and it's inconsequential. And I hear God saying that it's war, that war starts as a seed. War starts as a whisper. War starts as a whispering down in your spirit that you could overcome and topple what's got dominion in your life right now. But you can't do it and stay in your routine. So when God gets ready to wage war, and I feel this for somebody, I feel this for my country, I feel this for my women, I feel this for men, I feel this for families, I feel this for the criminal justice system, man. I feel like God is trying to wage war. I feel like God is trying to wake up the people of heaven. He's trying to wake up the citizens of the kingdom. I'm trying to wake you up so that you show up purposefully and you show up with intentionality and you show up with laser focus on who I've called you to be. I hear God saying it is time for laser focus. It's time for you to start speaking up. It's time for you to stop backing down. I want to eliminate the distractions that are happening in your life. Those distractions, they don't look like they're not coming up against your war. But I hear God saying they're taking momentum away from your fight. You're worried about the wrong thing. Who cares what they said about you? Who cares what they think about you? Who cares whether you've got the education? Who cares whether or not you've got the finance? I hear God saying you got the weapon. And you know what the weapon is? The weapon is the the encounter that you had with me when you have an encounter with God the encounter can't stay with you it ought to start overflowing it ought to start shaking up your friendships it ought to start shaking up your relationships because I had an encounter we don't have encounters with God so the encounter can stay in us we have encounters with God so the encounter can propel us so that we can show up with strength so we can say, I actually can beat this thing. I can wage war on addiction. I can wage war on the criminal justice system. I can do what my mother never did. How can I do it? What did I have that she didn't have? I had an encounter. I can't wage war on this generational curse. How can I do it? I didn't have what they had, but you had an encounter. And when you have an encounter, an encounter makes all the difference. Gideon has one encounter, and in one encounter, he recognizes that the thing that he was lacking was peace. Because what happens when we're living in a war zone, and God knows anybody alive in this time and day and age sees that we're living in a war zone, living in crossfire. Can we talk about the trauma of waking up and not knowing which blow you're going to get today? Can we talk about the fear of waking up not knowing how I'm even going to make it to the end of the month, the end of the week? God, I don't know how I'm going to make it to the end of the day. And when you get so used to that, you have a tormented spirit. When we think of tormented spirits, sometimes we think that it changes the way we go to work and it changes the way we engage, but you can have a tormented spirit and still show up and be strong for everyone else. 
You can have a tormented spirit and still be the support system that everyone else needs. You can be a stellar employee with a tormented spirit. A tormented spirit means that your spirit has lost peace somewhere. That fear has invaded the way that you live, the way that you think, the way that you see yourself, and the way that you see the world. You know how to pretend, but if you stopped pretending for just a moment, you would come to a place where you were honest enough to feel that I'm a little tormented inside. I'm tormented by the fear of loss, tormented by the fear of abandonment, tormented by the fear of failure. And so this routine that I hate, that I want to break out of, it also keeps me comfortable because when I live within this space, I don't have to confront those fears. But Gideon has an encounter that brings him to a place of peace. That's all I want for you. It's for you to have the kind of encounter that brings you to a place of peace. If you have an encounter with a good message and you go back to being tormented, you need to play that message over and over again because that word is coming after that tormented spirit. When Gideon has this encounter, his response lets me know that peace has changed him because he builds an altar as a memorial to the place where he experienced peace. A lot of times we have these moments of peace, but they are so fleeting that we don't build altars. PT preached an incredible message about remembering the altars that we have built along the way. When God sends you a message, whether it's a message from a friend or a message, a sermon like this, or something that you just scroll upon on social media, or a song or a word that just brings your spirit peace, you got to build an altar there. Because your spirit needs to come to a place of peace. When I was studying for this message, I almost called it war and peace. Because in order for Gideon to be qualified for the war that God wanted him to start outside of him, he had to first come to a place of peace inside of him. You see, so many of us want to know our purpose. We want to know what is our destiny? Why was I created? I want to know what God meant when he formed me in my mother's womb. And yet before God fully releases Gideon into his purpose, into his reason for existence, he first has to bring him to a place of peace. If you're searching for purpose, I want you to search from a place of peace. Purpose is not for the desperate. Purpose is not for the hungry. Purpose is not for the thirsty. Purpose is for the people who have found a place of peace because when you finally get into what God has called you to do, when you finally get to a position where God says, now I can use you, you have to recognize that the war is going to come at you so strongly that if you don't have peace to pull from, then that war could knock you off of your square. There's somebody who was in purpose. You're watching this right now. You were in purpose, but you're no longer in purpose. You got knocked off your square. I hear God saying that you want to go back to the place of peace. What was happening in your life when you were at a place of peace? Who were your friends? What were your habits? What were your routines? Because sometimes when we find ourselves functioning without functioning in purpose, without peace, we'll feel like we're running on fumes. We'll feel like we're running on empty. We'll feel like this purpose isn't powerful anymore. We'll feel like this purpose isn't meaningful anymore. We will lose sight and vision and focus on why we started doing it in the first place. It is from the place of peace that God gives Gideon vision. God gives Gideon vision from the place of peace, not desperation. If you're desperate, I can't give you vision because you'll manipulate the vision for your own malnutrition. I can't give you vision. If I give you strength right now in a time where you're trying to manipulate other people, then you'll end up abusing them. I can't give you strength right now. I can only give vision for those who are in a place of peace. I can only give you vision when you're not seeking validation. I can only give you vision when you're not trying to prove something to those people who slept on you. You got to be postured in such a way that you have such peace in who you are. Yes, I may know, you may know who I used to be. You may know how I used to act, but you don't know who I am now because God's given me peace. 
peace. You may know the way that I used to think. You may know the way that I used to sing. You may know the way that I used to create, but you don't know who I am now. You have to give people an opportunity to be introduced to the new version of who you are. This version of me has peace. I don't have time to be petty. This version of me doesn't gossip. I don't have time to be petty. This version of me doesn't care what other people think because I finally came to a place of peace. Peace is a weapon. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that your peace is a weapon. It doesn't look like it could be a weapon because it's silent. It doesn't look like it could be a weapon because it is not loud, but it is the most powerful weapon that you can have in a world that is distracted. I got peace. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it, so the world can't take it away. I got peace. That's why I can keep dealing with these people and then walk out of them and not smell like what they put me through because I'm dealing with from a posture of peace. I'm showing up from a place of peace. I'm creating from a place of peace. I'm not looking for an award. I got peace. I'm not looking for an applause. I got peace. I'm not looking for the views. I got peace. Where is my peace? My peace is in knowing that the Lord is with me. My peace is in knowing that I'm living in the presence. My peace is in knowing that I've been obedient to who God has called me to be. Everyone else can look for money. I'm looking for peace. Everyone else can look for friends. I'm looking for peace. Everyone else can start looking at who's got what and how they got there. I'm looking for peace. God, give me my peace. God, give them their peace. God, give me the thing that's going to settle my spirit and don't allow me to copycat off of someone else's peace. Do you know who your God is? God says what gave them peace may not give you peace, but I got peace with your name on it. I got joy with your name on it. I got purpose with your name on it. Do you trust who I am, says God. If you trust who I am, you'll stop looking at them and start looking at me. God, show me how I can have peace in this storm. Going through a divorce, but I can still have peace. Children acting crazy, but I can still have peace. Unsure of what the future holds, but I can still have peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding comes not when everything is the way it is supposed to be. It's coming in the middle of the storm, fighting cancer, but I still got peace. Don't know how I'm going to make it next month, but I still got peace. How could you have peace, they say, because the Lord is with me, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He is my peace. He is my shalom. He is my provider. He is my healer. He is my defender. He is my way maker. And if I disconnect from God, then I'll be desperate in a world with other desperate people. But if I stay connected with God, I'll have vision. I'll have strategy. I'll have creativity. I'll have everything that I need. I'll have everything that I need if I have peace. Peace is my weapon. Jesus, I feel you so strong in this room. The Prince of Peace wants to have a visit with you. Man, this isn't in my notes. But I hear God saying, I want to give you peace that you couldn't access when you were tormented. Peace that you couldn't access when you were in your past, when you were in your shame. The peace that God has for you is not just the peace that you experience for now. But I hear God saying that I can retrodate your peace. Mm. That I can bring you healing for a stage of life you're not even in anymore. You don't have to disconnect this stage of your life can have peace because the last few years had none at all. I hear God saying, my peace is so powerful. It can reach back and still give you peace about the things that didn't go the way you wanted them to go. Peace is everything. The presence of God can meet you right where you are and provide you with peace. When Gideon gets peace, and I studied this story. I saw that God gave Gideon what he needed so that he could be who God needed. God doesn't just tell Gideon, I want you to do this, and then puts him in a position to do it. God first works in Gideon before he works through him. God wants to give you peace first before position. Mm. Peace before position. 
Peace in your singleness before your position. Peace in this tax bracket before position. The kind of peace that says, God, if you don't do anything else at all, you've already done enough. That kind of peace. Because when you come to that place of peace, you can see clearly who you're supposed to be in God. Once God gives Gideon peace, he then tells him, this is what I want you to do. He gives him instruction from the place of peace. And with that instruction, he tells him, I want you to introduce new power into your environment. Peace and then power. If you have peace before power, you won't abuse power. If you have peace before power, then you'll use the power for God's glory and not your own. So he settles him in peace because it's time to introduce new power. That is the totality of what I pray this message is about for someone. That it would awaken first the pursuit of peace. And for those of you who have discovered peace, that it would then propel you into that next stage, and that is into power. Because there are things in Gideon's world and things in your world that have been God for long enough. And God says, now that I have given you peace with who I am and who you are, I want you to introduce new power. I don't know who you are and where God has positioned you in this season of your life. But I want to make it emphatically clear that if you continue to introduce the same old power in this old system, then you are not releasing everything that God has called you to be. That God is not calling you into the new. He's not calling you into the uncertain so that you can release what has already been seen. <laughs> but I want you to take what they have been using. But I want you to allow God to show you how to put it together. <laughs> Man, all of the pieces are there for what God wants to do. But the person is not there who can build what God wants to build. All of the pieces are there for what God wants to do in your life and through your life. The finances are there. The connections are there. The education is there. The relationships are there. It's already there. But the person who knows how to hear God's voice to bring it all together, they're not there yet. But I hear God saying, it's you. And God says, if you're going to submit to this and surrender to this call, you can't be afraid to touch the old things and make them a new thing. God doesn't send Gideon out to grab old new things. He doesn't say cut down the tree. He says, take the wood they're already using. Take the bull that's already there. It's already there. Everything you need is already there. But you got to see it the right way. You got to see it from the place of peace, from the place of confidence, from the place of certainty. So they got their routine things. But a new you. And hear God saying, you're not going to just come out of your routine. But you're going to change the routine of everything connected around you too. This is how change happens. This is how transformation takes place. My favorite part of the scripture, and then I'm going to close. It's Gideon. He's got peace. He's got position. And he's got power. But he still got fear. I think that's important for us to know. Because a lot of times we think if we have all of those things, then we won't have fear either. But the last scripture in my text tells me 
that Gideon was obedient. He took the men from among his servants and did as the Lord said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. This stands to reason to me that sometimes you got to get out of your routine in the night. Sometimes it doesn't happen where everyone can see it. Sometimes it doesn't happen where it's on display. But just because you aren't ready to release it to the world doesn't mean that you can't start practicing within your own night. I want to pray with you. Because as I was reading this message and studying this scripture, I kept hearing so strongly that God is looking for warriors. That God is looking for people who are going to be serious about the call that is on their life to the point of sacrificing the way that they've always done things. I've always lived in this city I've always gone to this place. I've always created this way. What if I told you, and this was with all compassion, that God doesn't care about the way that you've always done things? This is an opportunity for God to show you a new way of being, which means you're going to need a new way of doing. And I was studying... And I saw that point about Gideon being afraid to do it by day, but he was going to do it anyway. I felt like God was going to call some people out of their routine in this message. And that he wanted me to highlight this point because there are some people who will not get out of their routine because they're thinking ahead about how it's going to affect their whole life. But I felt like God wanted me to highlight this so that he could allow you to see the baby steps that he provides on the way to destiny. I know we love the big leaps of faith. I know when we like to leave everyone and tell them, listen, go on, I'm by, I'm doing something different. You ain't never seen this before. But there are some of us who change little by little, baby step by baby step. Baby steps are still ordered steps. Baby steps are still progression. Baby steps are still transformation. Gideon's going to do exactly what God told him to do. And he's going to stretch himself to do it. And he's still going to find a way to do it. Even if that means that he can't do it in the way that would seem most obvious. You're watching this message and maybe you've got a big shift to make. And because you're not ready to make the big shift, you haven't moved at all. I want you to understand that you can take baby steps into the shift. You're not ready to quit the job and start the ministry. Can you start the ministry? Can you draft the sermon? Can you create the email? You're not ready to remarry again. You just got out of a heartbreak. Can you allow your heart to be healed? You're not ready to forgive yet. That pain was so great. That grief was so terrible. Can you just open your heart to the possibility that maybe this bitterness is not serving me any longer? I'm not asking you for a big step. I'm asking you to take a chance on a baby step. If Jesus can point out to us the power of a mustard seed, I wonder what that would look like, that mustard seed working on behalf of what God wants to do in your life in your circumstance right now. That's what it means when it says, sometimes I have to do it in the night because I'm not afraid to do it when all the lights are on. That counts too. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with someone who's stepping out of their routine. You've been listening to this message and you feel the conviction that can only come from the Holy Spirit. A type of conviction that says you can't keep living the way you've been living. You can't keep thinking and acting and doing the way that you have been. 
It's time for you to get out of your routine and to try on something new. And you may have to try on a few different rhythms until you find what is authentic to what God has for you. But the first step is for you to break covenant with what has always been so that you can experience what can be. Holy Spirit, you've pricked our hearts. You've pierced us in a way that only your word can do. Thank you. Thank you for loving us too much to leave us the same. Thank you for loving them too much, God, to allow them to function on autopilot. Thank you, God, that this word is literally your love chasing after them. God, we turn to you. And we admit in your presence that change is scary. That disruption can feel terrorizing. It makes us feel small. It makes us feel inadequate. But God, we want to lay all of our burdens at your feet. All of our truths, all of our thoughts, our fears, we want to lay them at your feet. Because we will not allow them to be God over us any longer. Spirit of the living God, I ask that you would begin to meet each and every person connected to this message and that you would begin to break the tie that binds them to their routine. I rebuke it. In the name of Jesus, God, I ask that you would break the chains that tie them to their routine. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus because that chain is chaining them to their past. But God, I feel that you're calling them higher. God, I feel that you're calling them to destiny. And so God, we receive that call. We answer it in the name of Jesus and we say, God, we're ready to come out of our routine. We're ready to come out of the way that we've always done things God we surrender our ways for your ways we surrender our plans for your plans we surrender our routine for your vision we surrender our routine for your destiny have your way with our lives God is only you can do we are your servants the only thing we ask is what you've already promised Lord be with us in season and out of season, Lord, be with them. May your presence rest on their hearts. May it rest on their minds. May it rest on their being, God. And may it give them comfort. And we thank you, God, that we don't have to tell you how we feel because we have Jesus, the ultimate translator, who understands our weaknesses, our deficiencies, and yet sits on your right hand. We thank you for Jesus. Someone's here and they don't know him yet. Not realizing that they're having an encounter with Jesus right now. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God, that through Jesus we lack nothing. Through Jesus we have peace. Through Jesus we have strength. We receive Jesus afresh. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Man. Everything that we do, may we do in remembrance of you. Being reminded that you put sin to death, that you put failure to death, you put fear to death. And yet you were raised up just because we're in you were raised up too, free and victorious. We receive that promise. We receive our wings. Send us, God. We'll go. Even if we have to go in the night. We're ready to break out of our routine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.